<clears throat> I, um, I kind of try to stay away from those titles of revered and venerable and all that kind of stuff because um, I feel like it sort of sets a person aside from others. It's a kind of um, not, not um, appreciating the interdependent nature of our um, relationships in life. But um, Ruben asked me to talk about <clears throat> my spiritual journey. <clears throat> and uh, so I was writing a few things about it, um, trying to figure out what might be interesting to others to hear about. And um, I, I guess I have to start when I was about four years old because uh, my father was in the army, the full-time army at that time, and he wouldn't allow us to come as a family to the place where he was stationed because he didn't feel like it was a suitable place to bring a family. So my mother had to take us to church with her on Sundays because I grew up as a Catholic. Both my parents were converts, which I consider a plus because they weren't bogged down by all of the paraphernalia of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> And my father was actually against organized religion, um, which uh, I came to kind of inherit over the years. Uh, but when I was about four years old, my mother took us to church with her on Sunday. And um, I'm a very different kind of spiritual seeker. A lot of people in this Zen tradition particularly are very um, introverted, <clears throat> but I was, I came out of the womb as an extrovert. I don't know why, but I've always been very extroverted. And everyone says, oh, that's such a nice quality. But the problem with being an extrovert is that you, um, you, can't, um, you can't not engage. <laughs> and it's exhausting. <laughs> so for me, uh, at the age of four, uh, to go to church, sit next to my mother, whom I loved very much, and um, have her hold my hand and be in this quiet environment was a very balancing kind of experience. And I really consider that the beginning of my personal spiritual quest. And <clears throat> it has influenced me a lot <clears throat> over the years. When I got into kindergarten, I went to a Catholic school by default, because it was the closest school to our house. And um, one day the priest, the pastor of our parish came and told us about his life and his life as a priest. And at the end of his talk, he asked who thinks they would like to become a priest. And I was the only one in my kindergarten class that raised my hand. <laughs> And of course, he and my teacher laughed and they said, oh, you can't become a priest. You have to become a nun. So I didn't know what that meant. And I said, OK, I'll become a nun. So um, for most of my life, well, for all of my life from then on, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an altar boy, altar girl, but they wouldn't let me because I was a girl. But I memorized the mass in Latin and, um, you know, aspired to that. But all my life, I spent a lot of time in church, even though <clears throat> none of my friends really knew what I was aspiring to. A couple of years ago, my friends from elementary school found me on Facebook, and um, we kind of reunited. And uh, they were very surprised at what I'm doing. But the biggest surprise was that I had wanted to be a nun all my life because somehow they didn't see that. So that's kind of, I went to the convent after high school. It was at a time of great chaos in the Catholic Church. And I, um, I found it very confusing, even though I loved it. I loved the life. Uh, but it was confusing because at that time, it was in the early 60s, uh, there was a lot of 
um, conflict about how to go forward. I always say that Pope John the 23rd, who was a very liberal Pope, um, he, he said, let's open the windows and let in some fresh air, and then he died. And so it, it created a lot of questions and ideas about change, and, but we didn't have any kind of roadmap at all. And so it, what I found in the convent was that there were two sides, those who wanted change and probably sought it in ways that weren't particularly the most nurturing, um, but those who wanted everything to stay the same. And there was a huge division. And so for a young person in their teens, who was aspiring to some kind of deep spiritual life, it was very confusing. When I was 21, I left. And at that point, I just couldn't believe in anything anymore. And I threw out the baby with the bathwater and lived a pretty wild life in my 20s. And of course, by the end of my 20s, I was not wanting to do that anymore. It had just created a lot of confusion. And so I went on a search for a teacher. And what I did was I got on a bus, I got a ticket to go anywhere I wanted and I could change it whenever I wanted. And I, um, first I went down to Colorado and visited some of my ex nun friends who had you know, left after me, but whom I still kept in touch with. Then I went out to San Diego to visit my sister who was living there with her boyfriend. And I ended up in San Francisco. I had this ticket to go wherever I wanted, but I was broke. I had visited a convent friend in California and she had lent me $20, $25 or something like that. So I wasn't completely broke, but I didn't have a whole lot to sustain myself. Um, and I got to uh, San Francisco and started wandering around and ended up at the Zen Center. And something about it, when I walked in, I felt something that made me feel that I wanted to pursue this. And I was curious. And, um, but I didn't have any money except for this $25. And so I um, was talking to the woman in the office and, and she said, you know, can I help you? And I said, well, I'd like to stay, but you know, I don't have any money. She said, well, um, why don't you get a job? And I said, well, yeah, maybe I should. And she said, well, what can you do? And I said, well, I can teach and I can type. And she said, just, just a minute. And she went into the office and um, called her sister who worked for a place called the Trust for Public Land. And they needed a typist for two months to retype their training manual. So I went in and I got the job. And uh, then I went back and I said, well, now I need a place to stay. And she said, well, go look at the bulletin board. And I looked at the bulletin board and I found a place about a block away from the Zen Center. And, um, and two days later, and, and it was full of, it was, it was a flat with 10 people. Well, I was the 10th person. And at that time, you know, it was kind of the hippie era. It was, in the, it was just after the hippie era. And so people were looking for this kind of balance. And uh, I had the right sun sign and I was a female. So they accepted me at this place. They were all Zen people. It was a block from Zen Center. And a few days later, uh, Katagiri Roshi arrived from Minnesota, which is where I had started on this search for a teacher. And uh, everyone said, oh, you must know Katagiri Roshi. And I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, come and hear him speak at Green Gulch. Green Gulch Farm is a, <clears throat> one of the, one of the Zen, Zen Center, San Francisco Zen Center um, practice places. It's in Sausalito. <clears throat> so I uh, went out there and I heard him. And uh, somehow I was shuffled right up into the front row. But what had struck, what struck me about him was that 
I didn't really understand a lot of what he said, but when he said something that sounded kind of stupid to me, he would just pause and continue. When he said something that sounded really brilliant to me, he would pause and continue. And I thought, <clears throat> this is what I want to do. I want to learn to continue no matter what happens. And so um, he left a few days later. And when I was finished with my job, <clears throat> a few months later, I went back to Minnesota and started studying with him. I really didn't want to study Zen because it's very hard for an extrovert to sit still. Plus, I've also, I was also doing a lot of dance at that point. And uh, when you dance a lot, you can feel every muscle in your body. And so I was always shifting my position. And I had a reputation at the Zen Center for, as someone who couldn't sit still. But Katagiri Roshi never said anything about that. I was planning to only stay at Zen Center until I um, learned how to meditate. I just felt like this was the person I, I should learn how to meditate from. But after a few months, I realized that it wasn't enough time. And that I needed to continue for a little bit longer to learn this. Also in Soto Zen, <clears throat> and my teacher really emphasized this, um, there's Dogen Zenji, who was the person who brought Soto Zen from China to Japan, really emphasized the importance of sitting with other people and not sitting alone too much. And my teacher's um, explanation of that was that uh, when we sit alone too much, our practice becomes very self-centered. And my interpretation of that, of his saying that, is that um, this kind of self-centeredness is, is that we're just constantly understanding what is happening from our own under, from our own perspective, and we don't we don't learn from others. We don't we don't expand ourselves beyond our own minds. And I feel that when we sit together, we may not be talking, but we are communicating. And I'm sure that every one of you has experienced what I mean. So this kind of communication, I think, is much, much more profound than the words we use, because the words we use are interpretations according to our own experience. Whereas the things we, we learn from others through through silence are, um, I think, just the real deal. They're, they're, really, they're really pure communication. We can see it in body language and we can experience it just by sitting quietly. In my tradition, we sit and face a wall. In other words, we sit and face ourselves. It's kind of like looking in a mirror at our minds. And it's very interesting because just like we can't see our eyes with our eyes, we really are so, um, what, kind of identified with our thinking. That it's very difficult for us to see our own thinking from our thinking, from our own mind. But somehow, uh, my experience has been that when I, um, sit and face the wall, I notice things about my thinking. I don't have to try to notice it. In fact, when I first sat down, I was being very stubborn and I thought, I'm just gonna sit here and see what happens. I don't want anybody to tell me how to do this. I don't want anybody to tell me what I should be doing. I just wanna sit here and see what happens. And if something happens that, um, gives me a deeper understanding, then maybe I'll pursue it. Otherwise, I'm out of here and I'm gonna go find something else. And interestingly enough, that is the practice of Soto Zen. It's called Shikantaza. It means just sitting. And what I, how I define Shikantaza, my teacher defined it as just sit down and shut up. And he wouldn't give us too much information about how to do this, but the way I describe it as shikantaza is just sitting is to resist the compulsion to do something because usually we want to do something. And, you know, just like 
we can't stop thinking by our thinking because that's just more thinking. We can't, we can't experience reality. We can't experience the interdependent reality in which we live by um, trying to do it with just purely with our minds. Dogen Zenji describes it as, he describes the experience of Shkantaza, the experience of just sitting as <clears throat> um, the walls and fences and grass and trees, everything starts to expound the Dharma. And then he goes on to say, but this is not something which is experienced with the conscious mind. Uh, our conscious mind is just part of our being. And the awareness that we experience through Zazen practice is not something we can interpret through our minds, through our, our egos, through our personal experience and interpretation of life. It's something much more than that. And we can't experience it just by thinking about it. This is how Dogen Zenji teaches. He also um, describes this experience as Yuge, it's two characters. One of these characters means to play freely, and the other character means to um, be transformed through play. So my teacher, Katagiri Roshi, uh, defined uh, Yuge as uh, transformation through free play. And that kind of free play is like just the pure experience or the pure um, process, just like building a, a sandcastle on the beach. You just build it to experience building, a, building it. You know that it's going to get washed away, but that doesn't matter because the process is what's important. And that process is what really, I think, helps us to deeply see what, um, what life is. I didn't understand what Shikantaza was, but it fit very well with what I wanted to do, what I, um, I should say, what I didn't want to do, which was to overlay some kind of process on uh, the experience itself and I just kept doing it people complain about it especially people who are just starting out because they want something to do something to hold on to but Dogen Zinji really in all of his teachings he kind of he was kind of a rebel and I think one of the reasons why I rejected his teachings for a long time I didn't really reject him I just thought he was crazy you know, for the first six or seven years of my practice, I tried to read Dogen Zenji because my teacher was kind of a Dogen Zenji fanatic, and that's practically all he talked about. And uh, I tried to read Dogen, and I had no idea what he was talking about. And what I did think I understood um, just made me think that Dogen was just kind of some weird fanatic. So I put down Dogen, and, you know, of course, I went to all my teacher's lectures and everything. Uh, after about seven years of the practice, I'd been ordained for about two years. I, I resisted ordination for a long time. My teacher kind of kind of nudged me to do it. But, you know, I had a lot of fears around my, my experience in the convent and my experience of being, um, of feeling that I had to do something in a certain way. Just a second, I'm going to turn on the lights, kind of. Um, and I, I really resisted that. And I think my experience in my 20s, even though I was a kind of a wild child, I was really a wild child. Um, but one of the things that I learned from that uh, was how to extract myself from uh, the belief system that I had adhered to so strongly. And that was a really important thing for me to uh, begin to recognize, to recognize that there was a reality besides my definition of what it was. <clears throat> so I told you that I started with the idea of if anybody tries to tell me anything about what to do, I'm out of here. I mean, I really felt that very strongly. And I didn't really, I didn't embrace the community that I was practicing with. They felt kind of almost cultish, cultish for me. 
uh, to me. It, it seemed like they were revering this teacher uh, rather than just appreciating what he had to offer. I think one of the takeaways that we all had after he died, my father, my teacher died in 1962, uh, no, in 1990, at the age of 62, which is quite young. Uh, but one of the takeaways that we, we had when we all got to, when several of us got together who had studied with him for a long time, was that we were inspired because not only was he very devoted to the practice in such a way that we could feel it, he embodied it, but he was also a very real person that made mistakes and was willing to admit that he made mistakes. He never tried to um, put himself into a high, high role that separated himself from um, his students. He always felt that teacher and students taught each other. And you know, you've probably heard uh, the image, I don't know where it comes from either, actually, but my teacher in Japan mentioned it to me when I was in the monastery. The teacher-student relation is like the chicken in the egg, the chick in the egg, uh, pecking from the inside and the teacher pecking from the outside. It's a mutual kind of experience. And a teacher, oh, I hate the word I hate the word teacher because it, it kind of has a, a certain meaning in this culture. And I feel like um, it means you've got to be very um, kind of brilliant or very kind of uh, beyond other people. And that's not the way it is. We're all practicing together. But my teacher, um, how, I, how I took on that role was uh, one day I was sitting next to him. It was shortly after I was ordained. And we were having, we were at a dinner and um, the person across from me said, so what does it mean to be ordained? Well, I, I might have said, you know, what I felt about it, but my teacher was sitting right next to me. So I was like, no, you know, I got to ask him. So I turned and I said, what does it mean to be ordained? And he said, it means you become a teacher. And I was like, what? <laughs> because that wasn't really what I aspired to. You know, I, was, I had always aspired kind of to this monastic life. And I recognized early on um, when I'm quite young that what I was really aspiring to was simplicity, was simplifying my life in such a way that I could really look deeply at what I was, what human life was, who I was, and uh, and just pursue that uh, as best I could. And especially being an extrovert, I found that I was easily distracted. It was interesting to me when I was ordained because when I made the decision to be ordained, and it took me um, a few years, about, maybe about three years before I actually uh, could do it could say, okay, I'm going to do this. But when I finally said this, okay, I can do this. I can, I can go through this process because I know that this is something that I deeply want, that this will help me in some way. Immediately, my life came into focus. And I, real, I realized that this was the most important thing. And that prior to that, you know, other than my time in the convent and, and everything prior to that, but my, in my 20s, I had been just so distracted by so many things. And I'd been, um, you know, I can get interested in just about anything. I'm just kind of a very curious kind of person. But at that point, it was like, when I made that decision, everything came into focus. And I said, yes, this is very important. My spiritual practice is the most important thing in my life. And I don't think that it's necessary particularly to become a monastic in order to do that. My friend Ty, who, who used to be a trap, uh, not a Trappist monk, but a, um, a Jesuit priest, he's not anymore, but he told a story one time. Uh, he told me he, about this, this guy who lived, uh, who was a hermit out in the woods. And he lived in a small hut and someone came out to him to ask him, what is the best way to do a spiritual practice? Well, he said the best way is to be totally engaged in life and to have a job and have a family and 
um, recognize that uh, the spiritual practice is the most important thing. And he said, oh, so what is the sec second best way? And I don't remember what that was. It was like to, you know, to, I don't remember what the second best way was. So he said, well, why is it that you're out here in the woods, you know, being in a hut? Uh, and he said, well, we all, we all do our best. And that's the way I sort of feel about it. You know, I, I, I kind of need this practice, need this, um, this practice of having, having robes, putting on robes and, and being, living in a temple. I need it to help me focus um, because that's, that's my life. But um, I think the most important thing is to recognize that, <clears throat> that deep aspiration, that deep knowledge that we all have, that we are interdependent with all beings and that everything is always changing, that there's no way. That Tao or Do in Japanese is, is not something definable. If you look at the history of Chan, um, actually I, I taught a class in, in Chan and Zen at a local college. I was asked to teach this class and I thought, how am I going to teach this, you know? And what I did was I decided to just go back to the origins of Chan and look at the teachings of the teachers that kind of have stood out, have popped out and have created kind of little shifts in the practice. And the reason I did this was because I, I wanted the students to realize that um, it's not a fixed kind of understanding. It's not a fixed kind of practice. The forms are not the practice. The forms are important for keeping us all together in this practice, but they are not the practice itself. And the, um, the teachings, as they've been interpreted, we don't have to completely buy into them. We don't have to dismiss them if we don't understand them, but we don't have to say this is the way it is, um, which is a tendency that we as humans have. It's described by Buddha as dukkha, you know, wanting to hold on to something. And, um, and this takes us away from the recognition that things are always changing. And it, it really is the source of deep suffering, even though we may not recognize it. And it's the source of chasing after, always chasing after something uh, to hold on to and never being um, satisfied with things as they are because they may not be how we define them or how we expect them or how we understand them or how we interpret them. And so Dogen Zenji in his Kantaza practice says, just sit and experience life as it is. Um, it's not necessary to chase after something called enlightenment. And he said, the problem with having techniques at, uh, for this recognition is that we can easily get caught in these techniques. Um, <clears throat> and of course, with, a, with a, a good teacher, that's not necessarily the case because that teacher can move us forward in the ways that we need to move forward. But he said even the monks that he was practicing with for in the early, in his early days, before he went to China and discovered uh, Shikantaza practice, uh, he said he felt like they were practicing as a means to become enlightened. And what that does is it's, it's the discriminating mind putting enlightenment outside of ourselves and chasing after something. And he said, Dogen Zinji says again and again in all of his writings that um, enlightenment or awakening is something that we experience every time that we sit down. And all we have to do is recognize that experience. And that experience is not some big lofty thing as we can imagine it to be. It's just what we recognize as our obstacles, what we recognize as our strengths. And it's 
these aren't things that are part of our our conscious understanding our conscious understanding is always defining this is good and this is bad this is right and this is wrong this is enlightenment and this is not this is i am this and i am not that and comparing ourselves with others and this kind of discrimination is exactly the kind of thing that creates problems it's constant this practice is a constant practice it's not something that ever um, that we ever stop can stop doing it's constantly awakening to things as they really are and um, to just sit down and shut up no matter how we do it or why we do it it helps us to recognize this and Dogen Zenji talks about and I don't think this is originally Dogen's idea but this is where I learned it from he says it's like walking in the mist you can sit for a very long time before you see what's happening. Just as if you're walking in the mist, you don't necessarily feel that you're getting wet. But after you've walked for a really long time, you, f you notice that you're soaked. So this is the way this practice works, no matter how you do it, no matter where you do it. It's just sitting down and shutting up. Whatever you do, is it's just sitting down and shutting up. And so, <clears throat> I have uh, practiced, I practiced with my teacher and we uh, developed, which we started a monastery in southeastern Minnesota. Katagiri Roshi, was, he was Japanese, but he practiced, he taught in, uh, first in San Francisco with uh, Shunyu Suzuki Roshi. Uh, and then when Shunyu Suzuki Roshi died, he went to Minnesota. Uh, at the invitation of a few people who were practicing there. And uh, out of that, the Zen, Minnesota Zen Meditation Society started. And after that, he wanted to start a monastery. And we found some land in southeastern Minnesota, a large piece of land with nothing on it. Uh, I shouldn't say nothing because there was lots of beautiful nature and there was a creek and and our first meditation hall was a, a big army tent. And our first kitchen was, an, was a tent. And we all lived in tents. And we practiced down there. We couldn't practice there in the winter because Minnesota winters are too brutal for most of us city folks. And so we practiced when we could down there. And uh, then he encouraged me to go to Tassajara after I was ordained. And Tassajara is a monastery in a way out in the mountains of um, Carmel, near Carmel Valley in California, between Carmel Valley and Big Sur. And I spent um, a year and about four months there. And <clears throat> then I went to, I wanted to go to Japan. And uh, Katagiri Roshi really didn't want me to go to Japan, but when I, said I really wanted to go there he sent me to a monastery called Hoshinji which is in Obama Obama Japan um, <clears throat> and uh, it's just north of Kyoto on the Japan seaside and there I found a very devoted monastic community which was you know in, a, in the Japanese tradition of Soto Zen uh, your training is you only need two years of training and uh, <clears throat> I didn't go there to train, though. I went there to practice. I didn't know anything about certification or training or anything. I just went there to practice, and I happened to f it happened to be a group of people who were very devoted to Zazen practice and living in a temple and taking care of the temple. Um, I often say that what the training in a, in a Zen temple is uh, how to clean the temple, because that seems to be the emphasis, aside from Zazen, that was the most important thing that we did was to take care of the temple and clean the temple. And of course, serve people who came to visit the temple in whatever ways they needed, whether it was through memorial services or um, whatever they needed um, to uh, help them in their spiritual practice. And But when I was at Tassajara, one of the things that I, I uh, kind of came up for me <clears throat> this was in 1983, was uh, how much my experience of Zen was very uh, dominated by 
men. <laughs> it was predominantly men. I noticed it when I first went to Minnesota Zen Center and I, uh, when I was at Tassajara, particularly in my second practice period, um, there was, uh, it was about three to, three to one male to female. And of course in Japan, I was in a monastery, so it was, there were um, about 30 men and about six women. But when I was at Tassajara, one day I was sitting at lunch and it just popped into my, my head, I should start um, a place where we can pursue women's insights, women's practice. Because I felt like what was happening was that a lot of our insights were getting lost, either because they were being ignored or because, um, you know, men just weren't understanding them. And sometimes I found that my insights were made fun of. And I thought, why am I allowing this to happen? Why do some of us women allow our insights to get lost uh, because the men don't understand them? And so I, de I decided I wanted to start a women's temple where we could just live together and do this practice together and see um, what came up for us. One of the things I experienced in going to uh, all girls Catholic schools was that when I had an insight and I stated it out loud, there was always someone who understood and I could take it to the next level. And I felt like there was not a kind of balance in the Zen world, at least in the Zen world as I had experienced it. And so I wanted to create a place where we could strengthen our insights and bring it back so that it would, there would be some kind of balance. But I didn't feel ready to do it. I talked about it for many years. and. Um, I didn't actually start do, start creating this place, uh, Great Tree Zen Women's Temple, until uh, about the two, 2000. And that was at the nudging and pushing of my Dharma brothers and sisters who were saying, hey, you've been talking about this for a really long time. Would you please do it? And at that time, I had already kind of um, become the head or the leader of the Zen Center of Asheville, which was in Asheville, and it was basically a lay practice center that had developed simply because I arrived in Asheville and I was a monk, and people saw that as an opportunity to bring the practice together. And so even though it wasn't something that I really intended to do, I thought, well, if this helps people, uh, I guess my job is to just be here and just to... Um, uh, keep the practice alive. And so that's what I did uh, for several years. And also I was working with the Charlotte Zen Meditation Society, which is what originally brought me out to North Carolina. But finally, after a while, I thought, you know, my Dharma brothers and sisters are, are really right. I just need to do this. I, I just need to start it. And I, I just mentioned it. And uh, the people, the folks in Charlotte just jumped on it and created a board and and moved it forward and fundraised and before I knew it after a few years it just here it is and uh, Rudman and his his wife Maria were out here as he said a few weeks ago and, and they saw the results of it it's, it's quite a nice place and we have a nice piece of property and um, it's really ideal for this kind of um, startup it also has a place where we can expand if we want to and uh, but at Zen Center of Asheville, um, most of my students were men, <laughs> which I found kind of interesting, you know. And I, I knew at that point that <clears throat> something about the way that I was pursuing the practice um, was more appealing to men than it was to women. So this has uh, been kind of an interesting uh, exploration for me, and continues to be very interesting to see why it is um, that I am not uh, appealing to women uh, as much as to men. What is it about this? And the way I, I kind of see it as uh, when I used to study dance, uh, there were some teachers who created choreography that I could immediately, that immediately um, I understood and could do. And there were other teachers who created choreography that it took me a while to kind of understand and figure out. 
And that's the way that I have experienced Zen. It, it took a long time for me to really embrace it and understand the spirit of it um, through the forms that have been created and through the schedules uh, that have been developed. And um, I don't know whether these are the things that, that uh, maybe it's the style. I don't know exactly what it is, but for me, Great Trees and Women's Temple is simply an exploration to see if there's another way to do it. And to, uh, just as I, I, I told you, I, I wanted to pursue um, uh, the teach, teaching Chan Buddhism from, from the historical perspective of how did the teachings change? What was it about these various teachers that changed? I started actually in Vietnam where uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has written a book where he says, actually, Chan Buddhism started in Vietnam. You won't find this in most history books because they uh, say it started with Bodhidharma. But I started with uh, this, I think his name was Tang, Tang Hui. I can't remember. There's a book about him that was written by Thich Nhat Hanh. And I started with his writings and then moved on to Bodhidharma and Hui Nang. And then I moved into Japan and, and you know, as we studied Dogen. And also uh, there's some women teachers in Japan that we looked at. And then we moved to the United States and uh, what teachers in America have influenced Zen, including my own teacher. And that was the way we studied it and looking at the different ways in which it was affected, not only by cultures, but by the, the teachers themselves who had insights. And we all have that capability to have insights and we all, I believe, have to um, see this practice from our own experience and pursue this practice from our own experience with the guidance of a teacher. Um, we, we study, you know, that Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are the three important components of this practice. And Buddha starts out with a teacher as a guide, but the teacher as a guide just helps us to understand our own Buddha nature or helps us to understand what is Buddha nature. Uh, Dogen Zenji says, um, Buddhism teaches that we all have Buddha nature, but he says, that's not really the way it is. We are, everything is Buddha nature. And uh, we are part of that. And to discover this Buddha nature, it helps to have someone to guide us to that from their own experience, from their own practice. And Dharma is just simply things as they are. It's also the teachings which point to things as they are. It's also everything in the phenomenal world, which is things as they are. And Sangha, which is um, in, in, in Japanese Zen, it's described as uh, in the way they wash potatoes, they put them into a bucket and uh, put in a little water and roll the potatoes around and the potatoes all wash each other. That's the way Sangha is. And Sangha is supportive and it's also difficult, as I'm sure all of you have experienced. When you're together, it's like potatoes being bumped, bumping up against each other and knocking off the dirt, knocking off the unnecessary. And so um, Buddha is, uh, Buddha nature is uh, something that we are all part of, and it's something that we can all discover um, through the guidance of a teacher and um, under, and recognize where our obstacles are and recognize where our strengths are and contribute them. Um, and I'm going to finish by telling you, Katagiri Roshi said that the main purpose of our practice is to learn how to live in peace and harmony with all beings. <clears throat> so that's all. I don't know um, what else you do uh, when I don't see you. So uh, maybe you can tell me where to go from here. Are we done? Does anyone have anything to add or subtract or question? Uh, Tejo, we will close with the uh, boundless compassion again, and then maybe we have a few for a question and answer, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Boundless compassion, as only for the sons of the Lord.
Helen to uh, allow our faces to be seen, please. Yes. And first, I apologize, Tejo, uh, you had not been able to see our faces while you were giving a talk because you, uh, uh, well, uh, the transmission or the, uh, uh, and the yes, uh, the bandwidth is not sufficient to have everybody and so we're trying to minimize the incident of freezing. So sometimes a speaker can freeze, but somehow uh, that is our way of uh, minimizing that. So thank, uh, thank you for your forbearance in speaking to a blank screen with different names. But you hit home with several very important points there. Helen, would you please start my video? I've been starting your video. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, especially in your description of spiritual practice as being fully engaged in life. And then also you're starting a woman's temple, women's temple really is something that is an important contribution to Zen in this part of the world. There are of course several other women or many other women teachers, but your way of focusing on that is really something that is a big contribution. But enough of me, I'm sure that you raised some points that others have uh, resonated with and would like to ask you about or mention something about. And I'd like to ask Helen to facilitate the question and answer or sharing, please. Helen, please take yes, it from there. Uh, you can raise your hand and I'll just uh, spotlight you or pin video you and you can speak after that. Anybody, please? Yes, Maria has her hand raised. Go ahead. So Tejo, thank you so much for your talk. I'm so happy to see you again after we first met in Asheville. And I think it's really um, perhaps not a coincidence, but I started collecting um, books on Chinese nuns and um, teachers before I even went to Asheville because I also had the feeling that um, 
we are studying this tradition and most of the teachers that we ever find in our koan books are not women and um, that their, this dimension is missing. And I think my question is maybe, was there some the experience in your upbringing in a Catholic school and then also as a nun being among women that you felt that um, there is something distinctive that women can bring to the practice also in this organized form of having a women's temple or where do you think it came from? Connection here and I got cut off. Oh, you're fine. It says I'm unmuted. Yes, oh, okay. we can hear you. you. We can see you. So could you, could you repeat your question? I didn't hear the first part. So the inspiration to, um, I, I explained that I've also recently been starting to read about more women teachers and trying to find out about the tradition because in our um, koan study, we don't have women teachers as such. And um, so um, my question was more specifically, uh, did you notice in your interaction with your teachers perhaps that there was a difficulty in understanding you as a woman or or it shouldn't be either or but your early formation of being in a catholic girls school and also then being in a monastery did you feel that maybe there is a different approach to practice among women than there is among the men I think there is, but I, I don't know what it is. That's why I said it's kind of an exploration for me because actually the Catholic Church is, is, I was told this very young when I was in high school that it was a patriarchy and we just had to accept that, <laughs> you know? And so I feel like women have always practiced separately from men in the Catholic Church, or at least in my, in my, a lifetime in my experience and um, you know it wasn't until and I accepted my teacher and I felt like we had a very um, we both had a deep spiritual aspiration that we recognized in each other and that he helped me really cultivate it and I really appreciate that <clears throat> but there's something about that that is not I feel like I, I got past some of those obstacles, maybe because I was, I was raised in a patriarchal um, situation and accepted a lot of that patriarchy. But, <clears throat> but also I had the experience of practicing with women. And uh, so I know that there's, there's something different, but I don't know exactly what that is. I, I went back to the convent where I, um, where I was about, three, two or three years ago, uh, just to see what, what was going on. What, what, what was it? Was there anything there that I could draw from it that I could, that, or what was it that was there that I was drawing from? And um, it was a very interesting experience. I hadn't been back in about 50 years. <laughs> so you can imagine what that was like. But I felt so connected to these women and I felt so much love for these women. And I, I really don't know what it was. I feel like I still want to go back and check that out again and, and see if I can get anything from it. I don't have the same belief system. I'm completely, you know, I have completely, those times in my 20s were trans, so transformative, you know, that I recognize some of the, the difficulties of the kind of belief system that I had adhered to. Mm -hmm. And really kind of, and then my, my first several years of meditation, I, I really kind of, and maybe I'm still doing this, I kind of processed through these, these belief systems and realized kind of maybe where they might have come from, but then what they became and how they've been interpreted and things like that. So, um, you know, I don't have the same belief system but at the same time, there's some kind of deep connection that I felt with these women. And they still embraced me. And uh, I felt their love. And there's something, there's something there that I feel is not present uh, in the Zen world as I've experienced it. And 
I, you know, the, when I brought this up at the Zen Center of Asheville and said, I've got to pursue this. I, and I'd been there for about eight years at that point. I said, I've got to pursue this thing. This is something I've really wanted to do. And we had to go through mediation for a year because the guys just didn't understand it. You know, and um, what I found myself saying was, well, um, I just feel I, I'm not doing this because I want to separate women from men or because I want to make a distinction, but because I want to find that balance. I feel like there's not a balance in the Zen world uh, that women's insights are not being, um, that we are not bringing them forth as we should uh, to bring about that balance. You know, I experienced something with, when I was at a meeting with some of my, some of the other ordained uh, people in, from my teacher, we were at a meeting and I said something that came from a very deep place. And one of the guys, uh, one of the priests, uh, the men priests said, uh, made fun of it. And I, I didn't react by saying, wait a minute, that came from a very deep place. Would you listen? I have something to say here. I reacted by uh, kind of attacking him back. And it turned into a, a very a kind of a conflict. And then somebody said, what's going on here? You know, and I said, I got to think about this. And I just, I didn't say anything. And they changed the subject and talked about something else. And I realized what had happened was that I was not um, acknowledging this really invaluable insight that I had, that I was, uh, I was allowing it to be dismissed. And I, I feel like that some of us do that. And it's, I'm sure that's not true of all women. A lot of women don't accept that when I say that and say, well, I don't do that, you know, but I, I'm not talking to those women. I'm talking to the women that actually do do that because I don't see many women in the Zen world that are standing up and saying, you know, we need this balance and here are our insights. Do you, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Am I okay. addressing your question? Yes, completely. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from uh, Jean and this will perhaps be the last one. Jean, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes. Um Thank you so much. That was such um, an authentic from the heart presentation and you're just so grounded, you can feel it. And um, I think my question is more of a comment. I've recently been reading about people of color um, also desiring this formation or a, a group to um, sit together. And I, I was struggling trying to understand and what you have described about the need for women's insights, I think can be applied. You know, I'm not a person of color, and so perhaps this isn't my place, but it, I found that very enlightening to think about that. You know, a place to bring up insights that perhaps people don't feel free to share in a bigger group. And I just find that very valuable uh, to think about. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. If you would like to raise your hand and let me know or comment. Okay, uh, uh, Emily. Well, it's, oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, Keisha, this is uh, uh, difficult for me to speak because it, it comes from my, I just related so much to what you were saying. Uh, uh, you you considered yourself an extrovert. When I reflect back, I considered that I had ADD. I just could not, um, I could not focus. And I still feel that is a, a real challenge for me in my practice. And that my mind, uh, uh, my teacher has done a wonderful job of, of getting me to focus on my breath. Uh, and, and to keep going back to that. But, you know, my mind can go into, uh, it's almost like all at once there are characters playing out, in scenarios, in, and I go, where did this come from? You know, and then I go back to my breath. 
I'm just, I just not sure what happens to my mind when I sit and, and face the wall. But um, it is, uh, I feel like, and, and I know there's no shoulds or should nots, and, and you, you helped me kind of accept uh, myself much more than uh, I have been doing, but it's a real challenge. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to comment, I would appreciate that. You know, I just want to, yeah, I want to comment on that. Um, I don't know. It says my internet connection is unstable, so maybe I'll get lost. But as I told you, you know, uh, my fellow students at Minnesota Zen Center were always, they were, they were always teasing me because I couldn't sit still. And we went through, uh, when I, we went through a, a Jukai, which is receiving the precepts, and that's when you first get your name, my name, Tejo. Mm -hmm. And my teacher uh, translated my name as uh, right stillness. That was, he gave me two different translations. And when I first got that name, I thought it was a joke because, you know, obviously I was the one that couldn't sit still. And, uh, but when I, after, after our Jukai ceremony, I saw him at, you know, the brunch or whatever it was. And he looked at me and he said, do you like your name? And it was clear to me that he saw something that I hadn't, I wasn't recognizing. He saw something in me. And I, I, you know, I feel like that's kind of a, my own koan or something. And so for years, I didn't even talk to him about that, but I, I just kind of looked at it. And at one point I did talk to him about the meaning of my name and but what I finally discovered was that you know the center of the cyclone is very still and that we all have quiet within us and that all of that noise and busyness that we see it's just it's just something that's an overlay on that stillness in fact I see it as kind of the opposite of what I learned in Catholicism you know in Catholicism they say in Christianity they say that you come into life uh, tainted and that you have to you know be purified but i feel like it's the opposite we come into life pure and we we just have to continue to recognize that and that for me uh, that is very much the part of my spiritual practice a uh, very much a part of my spiritual practice um is just re returning to that silence uh just remembering that silence remembering uh, the depth of um, what we all what we all have, and that silence is what helps us to recognize uh, that we're part of a bigger reality, and that everything is always changing, and that even those moments when our mind is too busy, if we don't, if we judge those moments when our mind mind is busy, oh, I'm doing it wrong, oh, this isn't the way it should be, all we're doing is adding to the to the busyness. So um, I think to just notice it and move on. And as you say, return to the breath. That is to me the, the most fundamental thing that we can do is just return to our breath. And that will help us in every aspect of our life, not just in our meditation practice. If we notice that we're getting distracted or off balance, we just return to the breath. So thank you for saying that. Thank you for reminding us all of that. Uh, let us now close with the uh, verse of purification and the uh, chant of Shalom.
like to uh, personally thank uh, Dejo, I can't even find it, there you are, for the wonderful talk this morning. And just to remind you, uh, Dejo, I did visit your Zen Center around 10 or 12 years ago, and unfortunately you weren't there, so your assistant was there, and she gave me this very nice mug. And if you can recall, when you came to Texas for the AZTA meeting in Austin, we sat together in the bus and you still had a lot of uh, hair there. So uh, thank you again and it's good to uh, see you. <laughs> 